Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's presentation and topics. And I first want to thank the Southeastern Coastal Center for Agricultural Health and Safety for the invitation to present on this very important initiative that FDAX has coordinated for our migrant and agricultural workforce. And it's something we continue to coordinate today with several partners, including our U.S. ISIS extension offices and through the end of this year. So for today's presentation, I would like to share with you the coordinated effort our department and others have taken to bring COVID-19 testing for migrant farm workers in Florida. And in the brief time that we have together today, I'm gonna give you an overview of our multi-agency coordination and our focused efforts to bring additional testing to the new migrant community entering Florida in preparation for the fall harvest season. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Philip, you gave great introductions. I don't need to say much more. I, I have a few titles after my name. I understand it could all be very confusing the emergency management arena has, has many titles, uh, but essentially I am an emergency coordinator for our Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And my focus area is to provide coordinated support for, for two areas. The first being our state agricultural response team referred to as SART, which is a great support team for our department and our agri animal and agricultural sectors in Florida during emergency and disaster situations. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I had a little hiccup in my, uh, in my screen there. Okay, um, so essentially I'm also the emergency coordinating officer for emergency support function 17, commonly referred to as ESF 17. Uh, which is essentially responsible for animal and agricultural issues in the state of Florida during emergencies, pursuant to Chapter 252 of our State Emergency Management Act. And in that chapter of the Florida statute, it does direct our Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to serve as the lead agency for ESF-17 in the state of Florida. And our ESF-17 mission area is pretty broad. And essentially the responsibility of that mission area is to coordinate the state's response for animals. That includes livestock, companion animals, exotic and wildlife, as well as agriculture, food safety, and vector control issues during an emergency or disaster situation. So a very broad mission area. But in this case, during COVID-19, the urgency to support our agricultural workforce and our food supply necessitated a coordinated emergency response to address the needs in testing for the farm worker population. And this entire effort was largely coordinated using the emergency support function system under ESF-17. So first I'd like to provide a little background context on our initiative here for testing for farm workers. And as many of you know, Florida's agricultural uh, industry is a $137 billion industry, a, a top economic driver for the state of Florida, second to tourism. And year round, Florida produces over 300 different agricultural commodities for over 47,500 commercial farms, and ranches with a very large workforce. And as you know, um, our food and agricultural workers are classified as essential critical infrastructure workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And they are really at the heart of this industry during these tough times. Um, and as you also know, most agricultural work is considered seasonal, which shifts the labor demands and makes for a highly mobile agricultural workforce within Florida and other states. 
And with the new migrant community, um, you know, expected to enter Florida during the fall har harvest season, FDAC's Commissioner Nikki Freed and U.S. IFAS Extension held calls with the state's leading agricultural associations on these top issues and mitigation needs for migrant workers coming back into the state and the safety of the community at large. And in those calls, there was really three focus areas that the state producers identified, which included testing, housing, and transportation. Testing being the primary impact where initial and accessible testing was needed to minimize impacts to food production and the community and get them properly isolated. And then with the secondary impacts being to housing and transportation and how whatever we can do to best educate the producers on those secondary impacts. But for today's presentation, we are gonna focus on testing. So to address the primary impact being testing, FDAX began the formal emergency response and coordination process. And what we did is submitted a mission request to our Florida Division of Emergency Management at our State Emergency Operations Center. And this was essentially to officially request mobile testing units for agricultural farm workers. And a mission request is really just uh, a fancy resource ordering process that's formalized between local and state governments. And it's a way we track requests, all the logistical supply supported issues needed for a resource. So in the case of testing, the counties were already managing testing at a local level between their emergency management agencies and the county health departments. Therefore, it was imperative that us at the state level in FDAC and the Division of Emergency Management work directly with the counties on this initiative because we would be leaning on them to help organize the mobile testing sites. And we would be leaning on them to provide the administrative and medical staff at each of the testing sites as well. So a very strong support model between our agencies was key to find solutions on how to best accommodate testing for this population. So after submitting our mission request, we, we quickly uh, began uh, preparations with the counties and holding um, coordination calls. And in our mission request, we included several counties. And those counties included Hillsborough, St. Lucie, West Palm Beach, Hendry, Collier, St. John's and Miami-Dade counties. And here we go, I've, I went ahead and listed them out there for you as well. Um, so in our conversations with, with the, the counties, um, it was really encouraging to hear about all the testing and outreach programs the counties were already doing for the migrant testing. And several counties had noted outbreaks in their farm worker populations earlier in April and May. And they were already working closely with the producers and farm labor contractors to provide testing on site at the workplace and in their housing um, facilities. So for some of these counties, our initiative was to expand testing in their area um, and kind of be considered as an enhancement to their existing efforts. But in several of these areas, this was certainly a new initiative. Um, but in working in the counties one-on-one -on -one with this, it was really important for us to work with each county on a flexible schedule that would utilize their resources efficiently while still providing more accessible testing to meet the need, whether that was opening testing two days a week or five days a week. Each county had different needs and different testing models, and each county had different resources as well. So it was really important for us to understand the actions that each of them were taking and how we could best leverage their resources and use them efficiently while meeting the need and serving this population. FDAC also provided each county with a list of preferred testing site locations. Uh, because what we found was a lot of the larger community-based testing sites were kind of located outside of the agricultural center, sometimes even, you know, an hour's drive away from these ag centers. So FDAC collaborated and identified several um, testing site locations and provided that to the county so that we can move forward on planning those locations. 
And UF ISIS was very instrumental in working with us um, on, on using their facilities as well and their extension offices in research and education facilities. And I think it's important to note that um, I want to take this opportunity really quick to say that while we were um, holding these initial calls with the counties, we were beginning a very large coordinated effort that would take many expertise and input to logistically coordinate. And throughout this process, we held several calls with agricultural associations, um, with county administrators, county emergency management, and producers um, who also express interest in providing input on our efforts and to help us plan this moving forward. We also held virtual roundtable meetings in Collier County and Palm Beach County. And we also had um, many more agencies involved in this process. Unfortunately, I can't fit on this slide, but I certainly wanted to recognize their efforts. So it was a lot of work that went into figuring out what the best operational picture for these sites would be. And our partnership with US ISIS was key and instrumental in making this work, especially for our communications plan, which I'll talk about here momentarily. So to make these testing sites work, we had um, several resources available to us to use. And first, let's start off with the state resources. Um, the Florida Division of Emergency Management did offer counties several resources that they could request if they deemed it necessary or if they wanted to test these units. And DEM was able to provide mobile testing trailers, which you see here in these pictures, all the personal protective equipment for the testing site, all the test collection kits, as well as the delivery and demobilization of all the equipment and trailers as well. And this was, like I said, all made available to the counties for this initiative if they requested it. Uh, what's also important to note is that DEM did agree to cover the full financial cost of these equipment and supplies for the counties if they requested it. So there were also county resources um, that were necessary to make this happen as well. The most important resource being the county would be responsible for providing the staff for the testing site, which would include their medical staff as well as all their administrative staff to make it logistically work and set it up. Some counties didn't use the mobile testing trailers um, that DEM had offered. Some counties actually had their own mobile testing trailers or vehicles, whether that been what you see here in this picture, a large trailer, or they were already contracted with a private lab who could provide um, a mobile testing van here, like you see here from Nomi Lab. Um, but definitely the staffing element was the most considerable um, cost and expenditure in this process with the counties and moving forward on a plan. Um, and it was, like I said, important for FDAC to be aware of this as we move forward with leveraging their resources and working hand in hand with the counties. And then, I'm sorry, I, I failed my click there, but they also provided other um, services such as the facilities, the site supplies, and the coordination between the labs that they were contracting with for the collection kits. And the counties needed to use their CARES Act funding or the FEMA public assistance reimbursement for these covered services. Now, the test types and the receiving results um, for for each of the sites varied as well. And there was much discussion on which type of test would be used at these sites. But what we found it was most important that either test detect an active coronavirus infection. And at these sites, both the PCR molecular test and the rapid antigen test have been used at these sites. And the PCR test has been working really well. And what we have seen is that the participating labs for these sites are actually overperforming their standard result turnaround time. So um, a turnaround time that would be, you know, estimated up to 72 hours or 48 hours was actually being turned around within 24 hours and sometimes even less. There were some very infrequent cases where it could be anywhere between a 48 to 72 hour turnaround time. Um, but otherwise it was pretty quick. And the process for receiving results was also very easy. The individual would receive a business card um, in English and Spanish uh, that provided them with instructions on calling the phone number to the lab to receive their uh, results over the phone. 
or they can elect to receive them via email if they provided an email and elected that method as well. So the next step was the communication and outreach strategy. You know, we were well on our way to finalizing the, the site details and having all the logistics in place, but now it was time to really make this thing work. And we really needed to be vigilant in our messaging for these sites. And we knew that this would be an ongoing effort and it still is. And multiple agencies would be coming together on this. So it was very, very important that we take a unified approach in our public messaging and create a communication plan that can be sustainable for the next several months. And US ISIS extension was very instrumental in helping us with that communication plan. One of the first things we did was create a flyer. And this flyer was really neat. Um, it's essentially a customizable flyer with fillable fields here where the individual county could partner with us on filling out the flyer with all the testing site details. And the flyer was available in English, Spanish, and Creole. And this flyer was used um, by the County Emergency Management, UF IFAS Extension, FDACs, um, our external affairs, and it was disseminated amongst all the agricultural associations, farm labor contractors, and also within the community. We also created an FAQ, uh, which was basically to provide very basic information about what to expect at the testing site and how to participate, which was very easy. At a minimum, the individual only needed to include their name, phone number, and sometimes their date of birth. But the, the idea was that the FAQ would accompany each flyer also be available in multiple uh, languages and that it was also approved by the county. Additionally, FDACs work to create radio and video public service announcements. Um, I've provided the script here to the Spanish radio PSA script that was hosted on several Spanish network stations um, across the participating counties. And our communications office also worked on creating a Spanish video PSA for social media uh, that provided information about how best to protect yourself and where PPE and how to participate at the site. And if there were any questions um, and follow up to these PSAs, FDAX also created a consumer hotline uh, that could direct people to the available testing sites in their area. And I see I'm running a little short on time here, so I'm gonna wrap it up. We also engaged many trusted partners in the community. Um, it was really important that we worked with those partners who have built trust within the migrant population. And that included several of the partners that you see here like Catholic Charities and the Treasure Coast Food Bank and many more who were instrumental in making these testing sites work, even providing additional wraparound services like food vouchers and food boxes and some of those other social services at the site. We thought this was very important to engage them to help build trust and keep these test sites um, operational with good participation. And so speaking of participation, I just wanted to give you a summary here before I wrap this up today um, on our testing, our, our testing effort. So, so far as of this month, we've had 17 testing sites support it across the state for our migrant farm workers. Um, we do have more testing sites scheduled through the end of December of this year. And what we've been seeing at these testing sites is more uh, individual testing rather than group testing, and more so in the form of walk-ups than appointments, just based on the feedback that we were receiving from the counties. But we've been seeing pretty good turnouts as well, anywhere between 10 to 70 tests given per site per operational day. And based off of all the um, testing days that have stayed open, we estimate anywhere between 470 to 3,290 migrant farm workers have been tested at these sites. And the credible range can, this, this credible range here can certainly result threefold and even more safer outcomes and reduced community spread because these individuals received fast testing results 
which could likely isolate them as soon as possible and thus minimize the impact to our food production and the community. And um, as far as positivity rates go in that follow-up data from these testing sites, we are currently working with the Florida Department of Health, who is researching the positivity and infection rates at these sites and the contact tracing efforts from each of these sites as well, so that we could kind of glean some more information um, on the outcomes of these testing sites to best inform our plans moving forward. And so if you'd like to check out um, the upcoming testing sites, we do have plans here. We have them in Hendry County, St. Lucie County, Hillsboro, Miami-Dade, Collier, and some coming up in Palm Beach County. So stay tuned for more information on these, but we definitely have testing sites planned through the end of November. And if you'd like to get your hands on more information about these testing sites, I strongly encourage you to visit our FDAX website at fdax.gov and visit our press release page. This is where you can find the testing schedule as well as the farm worker safety video series uh, that FDAX created in partnership with UF IFAS to uh, help provide guidance to farm workers and producers about ways to stay safe during COVID-19. So that pretty much wraps up my presentation and uh, I have my contact information here if you'd like to reach out to me separately with any questions. But with that said, I want to thank you for your time today and your interest in our efforts. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions and I'll certainly be sticking around at the end uh, for any Q&A. So I will turn it over now to Philip and Danielle for their presentation. Thank you so much, Leanna, for that great presentation. Um, yes, as Leanna said, um, we're gonna move right along uh, to Danielle Andrews. And just as a reminder, we will take questions in the chat box. Uh, you can put them in at any time, but we will take them and answer them uh, at the end of Danielle's presentation. So Danielle, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Philip. I really appreciate it. Awesome job, Leanna. It's great to follow you up. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Danielle Andrews. I am um, a colleague of Leanna's also at the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I'm based in Tallahassee. And I am um, sharing a little bit more today about something that developed out of the COVID-19 pandemic um, as a goal and kind of a passion project for Commissioner Freed. So I just want to make sure if I continue, um, I have my video turned off, but my screen is sharing. So you all can see the screen, right? Yes, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I'd hate to get like two, three slides in, I'm rolling and then I'm, what? You can't see it? Great. Okay, so glad you guys can see it. So um, the Florida Farm to You program came about through what we call the initiative of Keep Florida Growing, right? And so for us, some of the things just in terms of the background, we know that Florida has a variety of commodities. This map that I have here kind of on the screen showing you geographically where you can find some of our most popular commodities and some things that we're very well known for. Um, but agriculture is our state's second largest economic industry. So right underneath tourism for the state of Florida is agriculture. And so it's huge. It yields billions of dollars for our state and it's the livelihood for many, many people um, throughout the state of Florida. Approximately 2 million jobs are provided through the field of agriculture. Um, so when we kind of look at this uh, pyramid here, we think in terms of some of the natural resources all the way up to outcomes. Right? So this is kind of what is a good perspective in terms of thinking about how agriculture is used, some of its impacts in terms of policy, the research and technology side, what it looks like, economic policy, all of those different things. So it's kind of like almost like the agriculture industry pyramid, right? with one of the key impacts and influences being in these kind of five areas. So from your transformation, so the actual packaging and processing. So a lot of the things you see at various grocery stores and supermarkets and things, when those are packaged, that's a part of the agriculture industry. Of course, the distribution, 
from it being transported from various parts throughout the state um, or out of state even. So that that's a key factor in the industry. Access, so food safety, then of course it being accessible through things like farmers markets, through retailers, whatever the case may be, but also how people purchase the commodities. Then of course, how people consume them. So outside of like restaurants, hotels, schools, um, whatever the case may be, farm to table, consumption is a piece. And then of course, one of the most common pieces, we know the actual production of the piece. So all of those kind of break the agriculture industry into about five arms or so, which all five of those arms were impacted by the pandemic. So when we, we know that, uh, you know, Florida um, is not the only agriculture industry in the entire country, right? Although it's a large agriculture industry um, for the United States, the, our agriculture reach um, can be felt in all 50 states internationally, and there was a global impact. And so, you know, as we spoke with other um, state departments of agriculture and spoke with other um, trade partners and things, we continue to see a global impact of COVID-19. Um, uh, many of our um, growers and producers don't just um, keep products in-house. They um, go out of state, they go internationally. And so when there's any type of disruption to the food supply chain, you feel that globally. Yep. So some quick little facts, right? Um, this is kind of as I giggle a little bit now because as we're in November and we're months into this right I giggle because when we were in March a lot of these things just we saw and it just we didn't really understand why and now I'm like well why, why, why were we running out of toilet paper again knowing what we know now were people going to make masks out of toilet paper like what was the plan here okay um so just kind of some things in terms of food supply right first Producers can't quickly switch between supplying restaurants to stores and food banks. So here's what that means. Meaning if a producer was, if their business model was primarily relying on restaurants, food banks, large bulk buyers like that, hotels, et cetera, it is extremely difficult to switch and say, okay, all of a sudden we're just going to, you know, just start letting people come onto our farm and, you know, um, grab onesie twosie items here and there. That looks so different from how they have um, grown crops, right? When you are more of like a you pick, the way you grow and how you grow and some of the protocol you have for people to remain safe and things like that, things are just totally different. So a lot of people expected it to be kind of like a light switch and that um, many producers would be able to just go from bulk to direct to consumer. And it's like, okay, great. Panic buying, high demand and lost volunteers are squeezing food banks. Okay, so this was huge for us. So we actually, we commissioner helped champion kind of some like PSA surrounding um, panic buying, right? So for example, there are certain products that the WIC program, women, infants, children, um, there are certain products that are exclusive, um, exclusively WIC eligible. And when people were bulk buying, many people were taking products away, people who weren't on WIC. And so that meant that for someone who needs to purchase these products through the refunds they receive through WIC, no longer can go to that section of the store, find those things because people are just bulk buying, right? Um, and so what that also means is we think we forget about the human capital piece of agriculture too as well, right? So volunteers, volunteers are typically the first people to get, get cut, right? It, um, in any time of kind of crisis, right? We, we need volunteers, yes, but if we're trying to justify continuing to pay our folks during this time, we often see folks moving into overnight shifts, doubles and things like that. And of course, with the pandemic, volunteers became extra liability for places like hospitals, food banks, things of that sort. And so, um, the lost volunteers would often drive a lot of the feedings, making the food and things like that at food banks really, really impacted the food bank industry. On top of that, we saw lost employment for many, for many Floridians and or underemployment. So if they were still employed, it was significantly reduced hours. And so that drove up the need to um, rely on food banks even more. Okay. Um, and I touched on the third point about food supply chain um, when there is a disruption that's felt globally. Okay, so I'll just reiterate that. Fourth point there, no matter 
any type of disruption that we did experience, a lot of the average person did not see that, right? Like, of course, we started kind of seeing limits on water, limits on toilet paper, kind of limits on things, but it wasn't so much because the the demand could not be met. It was to help spread it more more around for folks. Like, right, these things that should not normally be going out of stock this fast, we need to be able to make sure we're reaching more people. We still had ample food um, months ago. We still currently have ample food you know, so there's no food shortage, okay? Disruption doesn't equate to food shortage in this case, okay? And then lastly, thousands of U.S. parents say their children um, don't get enough food, okay? So this looked differently during the pandemic, right? So um, for schools, when they moved online virtually, um, we were able to get a waiver from the U.S. Department of Ag, and we were um, able to authorize schools through our um, national school lunch program that we administer in the state of Florida to be able to offer food in creative ways. So we saw some school districts setting up buses to where um, students could get access to their breakfast and lunch. We saw um, all kinds of things during that time. But still, what many people were finding was that there just weren't enough snacks for their kids at home. Kids were just kind of going through things pretty rapidly and they ended up at grocery stores a lot. Okay. So this picture um, is actually was actually taken from a news article um, in the dairy industry. Um, initially in those first kind of few months between March through May, we saw a lot of images through um, social media, through media, news media outlets um, about producers having to plow a lot of, of their commodities under, including things like dairy, right? That there were just a significant decrease in the demand. And as we know with the agriculture industry, you plan months in advance for your harvest. And so by the time we got to the spring, this had been months in the works, right? Like no one could, you know, in 2019 predict that this was happening. And so they can say to um, producers, hey, go ahead and scale back don't grow as much, right? And so now there was having to be a lot of waste that was plowed. Okay. Um, see a little bit more, you notice that this is at the end of March. This was in Homestead, Florida. You see piles of squash, piles um, of zucchini, all kinds of things. Just, these were things that couldn't go to restaurants. They couldn't go to um, your Disney's, your Universal's, those theme park um, schools. So those that decreased demand, you see, these commodities that would have normally gone to these locations, they're here to having to be plowed. Right. So Commissioner Freed saw all of that, right? Um, and we had constant conversations as a team. One of the things I love about Commissioner is that she's very, very, very passionate. She's a fierce advocate. And, and so while she knew that there is no, as we call it, a silver bullet, right? There was no one solution that we could come up with right the second to um, completely alleviate the burden that our agriculture um, growers and producers were experiencing. But there was a way that we could help make a dent into that, right? And so this is where Keep Florida Growing kind of became born, right? Keep Florida Growing became a, and it, you can access it still to this day on our, our fdax.gov website. It was an initiative to help provide resources for our agriculture industry, including state level resources, as well as federal level resources. Okay. And through Keep Florida Growing, we launched a few things. One of them was called the Be Smart Florida campaign, which SMART was an acronym about just different reminders um, um, throughout the pandemic, especially for those who were so close to our food and you know working in the industry, which is kind of championing that, hey, we can all do our part. Okay? So that was one of the things that could be found there. Um, so this is what the Keep Florida, a snapshot of the Keep Florida Growing site looks like. However, our most popular piece of Keep Florida Growing was Florida Farm to You. And what Farm to You is, it's essentially a registry, right? Almost like a virtual farmer's market. If you've ever been to a farmer's market, you likely know that, you know, you can go from booth to booth and stand to stand. And, um, you know, each vendor is showing what they have. And, you know, you can pick out what you need, ask questions, you know, find out a little bit more about their business for the future and, 
you know, kind of go from there. So exact type of thing with Farm to You. It became a digital version of that because many farmers markets had closed down. Um, there just wasn't the re there weren't the resources to be able to keep doing what we had normally done. We were getting um, inquiries from other states on how we could help. We got inquiries actually even from Department of Corrections on what they could do to assist in, in, in not having crops go to waste. And so for us, it was just super important to make sure we were um, a resource. So the Keep Florida Growing um, database include, this is a snapshot of some of the things. So um, for, for consumers, if they needed information, um, like you pick farms, if they wanted to go be able to pick um, fresh fruits and vegetables, we have our you, uh, you pick farm locator here and you could see what's near you, any relevant videos, press releases, um, and then current initiatives, H2A worker visa. So we kind of made a centralized hub for anything people would need in continuing to work in the agriculture industry, support the agriculture industry throughout the pandemic. So the farm to you commodities list, this is a snapshot of that. Here's what it looks like. And so if you are a business or a consumer, we saw daycares buying for many of our producers. We saw all kinds of things throughout this time. It's like, wow, I didn't even know this type of business existed. So it was so cool to see the support. Business and consumers can click first and see list of available products. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Growers, this is how they were able to submit their products that were available. Um, the transportation services, which was a super cool part um, of the uh, of the site because that was actually created more out of response from the public. We actually saw many logistic and trucking companies say, what can we do to help? So we said, okay, let's add a component to our site for transportation services to be able to um, list their transportation services um, and for growers to be able to find transportation for their commodities. Many of these services, um, these logistic companies were offering severely discounted or free transportation. They had refrigerated, non-refrigerated trucks. It was just super cool um, to be able to see the influx of support. In addition to um, the members of the public who were emailing, calling, saying, how can I support Florida's ag industry? I love fresh fruits and vegetables. How, how can we make sure we still have access to them? So right underneath the, the sections I was just showing you where you could click, there is also a map. And this shows you kind of similar to the commodity map I showed you in the very beginning of the presentation, shows you various commodities um, that are available from the farm to you list. So this map is directly in sync with that list. So whatever you see, you see lots of honey, you can see tomatoes, you can see oranges, you can see all kinds of really cool things, corn. It's listed here, there's a little icon for it and it'll show you that we had buy-in from growers and producers throughout the entire state of Florida from the top literally to the bottom of the state. So if you are a member of the public and you want to find what commodities were available for purchase or donation, here's how you could do it. So there's a few ways to search. Let's say you know you're searching for a specific commodity. You don't care where in the state it comes from, then you may just wanna use the left um, search column, search for commodity. Maybe you want a specific commodity, but you want it kind of within your county. So maybe I'm in Leon County, so I may want to search for strawberries in Leon County, right? So I may want to click both of those before I go. Or maybe I'm in Leon County and I just want to see what's available for me there. So I just use the right search box. So let's say, like I said, I, oh, I use strawberries as an example, but we'll go with alligator meat. So good old Florida alligator. Um, and I wanted to see where that was available throughout the entire state. I can see that here, that at the time of this screenshot, I had three um, listings of um, alligator meat. I could contact these folks, figure out um, what they actually had available, how I could get it to my door, or if I'm coming to pick it up, whatever, you know, whatever my need was. But it was right here for me. Here's another um, snapshot. It shows you kind of the full list left to right. So this is for someone, of course, who was interested in like blackberries, blueberries, blackberries, and you could see when they were available, start to end. 
again, typically based on their growing season, the name of the business, who the best contact was, um, and any other information you may need to know. There's like a special note section too. So if they had specific things, maybe their hours or their website or anything like that. There are many producers, of course, who are also already online and people could directly go to that link and purchase. And then here's what the transportation services look like for the commodities. So um, if you were a transportation or logistics company, you could, you know, outline your information here. You know, if you had a refrigerated truck, a non-refrigerated truck, we ha even have cool little blue and green icons to show you which, um, which was which that the company offered. So just something else that I think is a really cool um, resource. So FarmLink is a way to be able to connect um, the public with local food banks, um, farms directly to food banks. I think this is a great graphic here. So remember when I talked about uh, that with lost volunteers, the increase in demand for food banks due to unemployment or underemployment. Um, sites like FarmLink saw a huge boost in, in, in hits to their sites because this was a great way to want if there were any leftover waste from food banks, they could help get it directly into um, the consumer's home. There was transportation that was there. It was, fun. it was just a great way to make sure there were no disruptions, but also meet continued demand. So if you know of a um, grower producer who's not listed on farm to you or you have more questions or wanted to figure out how to access farm to you, um, the email for our site is FL for Florida, farm to you at fdax.gov. And then our agency's website is fdax.gov. So Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services.gov. So um, that is all that I had. And um, I will pause. I know it says questions, but I will pause for a moment. Um, I think Philip was going to um, cue in the questions. So there was one question in the chat, and um, it had to do with um, the Department of Health um, and how, let's see, uh, worker housing. Um, and I believe Leanna um, addressed that a little bit. Um, so I don't know if you want to uh, discuss that at all on, on the microphone. Okay, yes. Yeah, so great, great question there about um, whether or not there will be new rules for workers' housing conditions um, regarding social distancing. So to my knowledge, I do know that our Florida Department of Health permits, regulates, and inspects the migrant labor camps as well as migrant residential housing. And they've also offered uh, guidance to these permanent facilities on safety measures and isolation measures. And they're rolling out that guidance pretty regularly in line with the CDC guidance. And so I did provide a link to the Florida Department of Health website there where you could find more information um, about that guidance. But as far as any uh, administrative code changes, uh, regulatory changes, that's a great question. I could certainly follow up on that with our department, but I'm not aware of any changes at that at this time, but I could certainly follow up. And please reach out to me via email too if you have any questions we could help follow up on. And I'll, I'll throw my email in the chat really quick too, so you guys all have it. And then I did see another question come through. Um, if we could talk a little more about the positivity rate in the testing program for the migrant workers. So as I stated in my presentation, we're working with our Florida Department of Health right now to research that information and to get uh, more precise data on the number of tests and the number of positivity uh, rates and cases at each of these testing sites and the follow-up contact tracing efforts uh, with each of these sites. So they are working together with the labs and with the local county health departments to help collect that information so that way we can uh, evaluate it and, and move forward on, um, you know, using, the, using that data to best inform our decisions moving forward about proper uh, testing sites into December or in the beginning of the year. So that data is forthcoming from our Florida Department of Health. And then are there any testing sites designated for migrant workers in Bell Glade submitted by Courtney Shippey? Um, that is to be determined right now. I do know the 
county emergency management and their health department do have county fixed sites open that are available right now to the community. But we are working with Palm Beach County Emergency Management and UF IFAS Extension to identify additional testing sites specifically for the migrant farm workers in the Belgrade area. So more follow up on that to come. We should be able to announce some um, additional testing sites on that soon. So stand by for more information on that. And please check out our FDAX website. You can get all the up-to-date information on our testing schedule. There was one question um, that I'll open up to Danielle or Leanna um, talking about um, some growers and landscape companies are saying they're having a hard time finding workers. Um, any input or knowledge on, on that, on employees, finding employees? I'm sorry, I'm rereading the question. One second. Um, okay, so I, I, this is a tough one. This doesn't so much fall within our wheelhouse. Um, so I can say that now one thing we are very, very, very good at on our team um, in the commu uh, commissioner's office is still being able to try to redirect. So um, to the person who, and Leanne, um, if you know, I'll pause for a moment. To that person, I can uh, send you the best email address who's really good with um, connecting where that may be elsewhere within a state agency um, or, or if I'm missing somewhere in our department to send you that. So I'll pause for a moment. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, and I'm making note of some of these. I'm making note of some of these questions as well, um, so that we can help provide some follow-up information on that. There was another question that came in about how effective is the outreach to the migrant worker community regarding guidance to the pandemic. And so I think there's a lot of agencies involved about providing uh, guidance to the pandemic as it relates to. Um, farm worker safety and workplace safety. Uh, particularly, I'm, I'm gonna use this opportunity to give a shout out to US IFAS for creating the Farm Labor Supervisor Training Program. Um, from what I understand, that training has been offered to multiple counties and it's been very well attended uh, by producers and farm labor contractors. And uh, essentially the training goes over proper safety and isolation measures for farm workers in the event there are uh, as a positive case or an outbreak in their facility. And so um, we've heard great feedback from the associations in our efforts during our working group calls with the associations about this training. They've expressed the value of the training programs and that the resources and toolkits that were made available to them also have been helping them implement best practices for their workers in the field and in the housing areas. Additionally, to my understanding, our Florida Department of Health, since they are responsible, the regulatory agency for permitting and inspecting the migrant housing labor camps and facilities, they too have been very active in providing guidance at these sites, um, especially if they were conducting any testing on site at any of these labor camps as well as in their contact tracing efforts to work one-on-one -on -one with the employer on providing them um, guidance on how to properly isolate individuals in the workplace. There was one question, and Leanna, you may know the answer to this one. If migrant labor workers reside in a county that doesn't offer mobile testing and work in a, counter, in a county that does offer mobile testing, are those um, migrants able to get tested in the county that they work in? That is a great question submitted by Chantel, and the answer is yes. And this was um, a discussion point that came up in much of our coordination efforts in the beginning. And no farm worker or their family member would be turned away from any testing site, no matter if they lived in Hendry County and worked in Hillsborough County or vice versa. If they walked up to or even registered for an appointment at any of the mobile testing sites or community sites, they would not be turned away. It was more important that the testing be available to them. And we understood that this is a highly mobile population um, with, with work changing from county to county, month to month. So the answer to your question is yes. 